Hello, everyone. This is Pat Deverka, and I'd like to welcome all of you back to our last session, uh, which is entitled Realize the Promise of Genomic Learning Healthcare Systems. Uh, you've heard my voice quite a bit throughout the, these past two days, and Terry and I will be trading off roles in terms of moderating this session. And I would uh, like to introduce our first speaker. I'll introduce each of you before you give your presentation. Same format, we'll take clarifying questions after each talk, and then we'll be looking for questions in the chat and in the Q&A um, to call on people for the panel discussion. So same format. And then we'll culminate at the end with us going through all of the solutions that we've been able to capture over the past um, two days and ask for input from everyone but specifically moderators um, and panelists um, uh, to make sure that we've accurately captured the solutions that we've heard and that we haven't missed anything. Because as Terry has emphasized, this was really a way for us to acknowledge all the progress that's been made for genomic learning healthcare systems and say, what do we need to uh, do next to keep that progress going? Okay, so I'd like to introduce our first speaker, which is gonna be Heidi Ring. Uh, Heidi. Finding the unmute button. Thank you for the introduction. Share my screen. Um, so uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to join this conference. It's actually our meeting. It's been outstanding talks and I've learned so much. Um, I was asked to talk about for turning genomic learning healthcare system data into knowledge. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the areas that are relevant to my work slides to advance. There we go. So I thought I'd start out and just sort of reiterate what is the current genetic testing workflow, the most common scenario of how genetic testing gets ordered. Um, typically, a provider orders a gene panel test. Uh, no clinical data is usually provided, maybe a very high level cardiomyopathy or something like that. Um, then the lab classifies all of the variants according to ACMG AMP guidelines using the existing evidence in the field. Um, and then they report for diagnostic purposes, a variant of uncertain significance, likely path and path variants. Typically just a PDF goes into the EHR, although it's a delight to see a number of places that have more than that. Um, the results get returned to the patient and there's often no further interaction with the laboratory in most cases. Um, a lot of labs now submit classified variants to ClinVar, but if you look at their evidence summary, they're often not including the case level evidence from the cases that they've tested in the lab. So that kind of model isn't really supporting a learning healthcare system from the lab provider back and forth dynamic perspective. Um, yet it's desperately needed. And we've actually just been doing a project to collect a lot of data across um, all the major uh, laboratories in North America. And you'll see on the right here, We've collected data from 1.5 million tests performed over a two-year period. Um, 97, almost 97% of that data is from um, uh, panel testing, and then about 48,000 exomes worth of data, 3% of it. And what you see if you look at um, two questions, diagnostic yield, which you can see on the right side, whether you're looking at panels or genomic testing, both are fairly low in their yield, yet they're fairly high in their yield of uncertainty, um, sort of inconclusive results due to VUSs, um, worse in panels uh, compared to genomic testing. And that it, both uh, of those numbers are statistically significant comparing panels to genomic approaches. So either way you look at it, panels or genomes, we generate a lot of uncertainty and we need to have a better le learning healthcare system to increase our yield and reduce our uncertainty. Um, interestingly, we did ask the labs another question, which is, do you subdivide your VUSs by sub-tier? Uh, and then tell us what your reporting you know, rate, rates are for the sub-tiers. So two of the laboratories did that in practice, Quest and Mass General Brigham. And what you can see here is when you divide, and I'm using the terms that we're likely to put out through the new ACMG guideline, uh, VUS high, mid, and low. And what you'll see is with the um, panel-based testing, it's roughly distributed high and low and most in the middle. 
But when you what you see is reported from genomic panel testing, it's much more skewed to the high side uh, or mid, and nothing is reported on the VUS low side. Why is that? Well, it turns out that in the practice of genomic or of panel versus genomic testing, provider must supply detailed phenotype data to the lab in order to interpret genome. You, you, you can't do anything without phenotype. Um, in addition, the standard practice for panels is that labs report all the VUSs. You can't do that in a genomic test. There are thousands of them. So you restrict based on evidence level and the gene phenotype match for the patient. Um, and that's what leads to the reduced uncertainty that we're returning in these results, as well as, in, in a lot of cases, the better correlation between the result and the patient's phenotype. Also, because we use trios often in genomic testing, we actually introduce another element of learning into the system. Uh, and what you can see if you compare the yield and uncertainty levels from um, panel versus, uh, or sorry, from trio versus non-trio testing, is that added parental data uh, improves the yield and decreases the uncertainty. So that's actually another layer of real-time learning that's happening by virtue of, of including parental genotypes. So now some, a small number of laboratories or a small number of cases get a slightly better process. Um, and I'll just outline some of the improvements although this is a less common scenario. And I, it's the same as what I said in terms of the text in black, but the added pieces here are, in some cases, that the lab um, has a VUS that looks suspicious, these sort of VUS high category. The lab may seek out more data. That could be to reach out to ClinVar submitters who have submitted on that variant to get additional data from those submitters. And we get emails like this regularly. I'm just pasting on the right here, the last email I got a couple of weeks ago. You know, Dear colleague, we've identified this variant in a neonate receptal hypertrophy. We're contacting you because you submitted to ClinVar. Do you have any more data um, on, on this variant and any phenotype? And we replied with Matt Lebo replied from the Mass General Brigham Lab. Oh yes, we saw an infant with DCM concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. This was the added variant. Um, we didn't do segregation testing, but here's the data. And now this lab director replies and says, "Oh, I thought we could dismiss this variant, but looks like we can. It's actually matching our phenotype, and so on." So this is the kind of learning that goes on in real time when you do this extra layer. Also that happens in the case of follow-up the provider. When the provider, um, a lab may reach out to the provider and say, gee, I found this variant, but it's correlated with this specific distinct phenotype. Have you looked for that in your patient? And the physician may come back and say, oh yes, I didn't include that on the rec form, but indeed my patient does have that. Or gee, I could run a test or another follow-up and look for that. Uh, and those things enhance um, this sort of feedback loop. And when you report those variants, you can then contextualize that with this additional information. Um, and it, in some cases, that may change the classification of the variant. In other cases, it may not, but still help guide the physician in their use of that data. Um, uh, and then in, for some laboratories, um, they may include that additional evidence, even if it's unreported uh, in, in the, uh, what they submit to ClinVar. This model does support a learning healthcare system, but keep in mind, this is fairly labor intensive and we're all pushing the labs to reduce the cost of testing. This doesn't help it. So, so we have to think about these models and how we can make them more efficient. Um, and I will point out the more even more idealized genetic testing workflow that might increase some efficiency here, um, which is that during test ordering, the full clinical data actually gets transmitted to the, the clinical lab and or they have access to medical records directly. Um, the laboratory may classify candidate variants, but then follow up seeking out global databases um, for shared individual level data, genotype and phenotype, also be able to access functional databases with higher throughput analysis of hypothetical variations. So you might know the variant's impact even before it's been seen in a patient, and there's increasing work in this space for saturating mutagenesis across uh, important genes. Um, also, access to familial genotype and phenotype data, not just running a trio when you have a genome analysis, 
But in fact, through databases, in fact, in the UK Biobank database, 12% of individuals have relatives in that same database. You might be able to actually get the answer to certain segregation questions or de novo occurrence directly through globally shared data sets that may include familiar relationships. Um, and then um, we can really start to think about, should we not be returning all of these VUSs, even in panel-based testing? Should we return a subset of VUSs like the VUS high uh, and those with a strong phenotype match um, and encourage follow-up by the physician? The physicians cannot follow up on every VUS view report, but if we were to distinguish those with high evidence, that really can help, you know, tell them when to spend that extra effort and even guide them more specifically in what they should be doing. Um, certainly improving the structure and genetic test results transmitted to the EHR, allowing this data to be combined, genotype, phenotype, and then shared more broadly for others to make use as well. Uh, and then certainly return that data to um, and submit it to ClinVar uh, with the evidence this time included. Now that Idealized workflow does depend on several key components. Um, so, and I will point out that if you look in ClinVar, although you can't just look in ClinVar and see this, but if you analyze the data in ClinVar, 75% of variants in ClinVar have been submitted by only one laboratory. So you often, you, you get one shot at this, one family. Um, and that is where the this ability to not just have access to global data or better curated, uh, evidence from the literature, things like that, but in fact support this true exchange between the lab and the and the provider, um, and in fact be, have this dynamic follow up loop to give feedback on candidate variants. Uh, in cases of variants that might be more prominent in the in the in the population, that is where this globally shared evidence base becomes really critical for both individual level data and functional data. And I will point out a couple of um, systems databases um, that I've come across that were intriguing um, uh, because I'm part of the advisory panel for CSER. Um, I this genome diver project that the New York City can, kids can seek, I think so, um, project developed where the lab would do the primary analysis, but then the interface shifts to the provider and based on the candidates and the phenotypes associated with the genes those variants were in, ask specific questions of the provider. Does the patient have this or that? And they answer present or absent or unknown. And that information that's very targeted related to the findings in the genome then get fed back to the lab to then further refine the report. And I think those kinds of dynamic loops will be critical for us to most effectively interpret the genomes uh, for many indications. On the right side of this um, database called Decipher that's maintained in the UK, um, and that database is not only facilitating analysis of genomic data and giving summary information, but for every patient that's analyzed through any collaborating group and a lot of data from the UK, and, and now I think the national health system is going into this system, structured phenotype data is just deposited associated to the gene. And then if you put in, in this case, I put in the gene GNB1, which I found in one of my cases, uh, look up and I can see every phenotype that's been identified in an individual with a variant, a pathogenic variant in that gene compared with a statistical comparison to that phenotype and its, and its specificity for that gene and it gives a p-value. So in this way, you can in real time be seeing whether the phenotypes and the variants and candidates that you're looking at correlate or don't correlate to candidate diagnoses um, based on a real-time growing patient population with phenotyped data. And I think, that, again, that's the type of, of higher scale process we need to engage in as opposed to email exchanges between providers and laboratories. Um, and I will say that, that efforts are really well underway in a number of countries further along than the US, um, partly because of national healthcare systems, to be able to share both variants and individual level data. That Cypher database I mentioned, GEL uh, Genomics England has their clinical variant arc that enables sharing of individual level data. Australia has built this Shariant platform to network all of their laboratories across the country. Canada has the Open Genomics Repository. Um, Japan has developed a database. Some have more or less, you know, um, where they are in their 
individual level data sharing, but a lot of national efforts. What we want to do is then connect these national efforts into an international global network. And we are working within the Global Alliance uh, to think about federated environments to share this data and be able to query on it uh, using systems that are built on the federated principles of matchmaker exchange that we built for gene level sharing, but actually now to do this more robustly for a variant. You find a variant, you search the database, you get the phenotype back from any individual who has that variant. Uh, and that works today in silos in systems like Variant Matcher at Hopkins or Gina2MP at UW or the Franklin, which is a commercial product. But by use of new APIs coming out from Global Alliance, we'll be able to connect global databases around the world to be able to share this data and query on it. So, that, so just to finish up with my last slide, um, the re really the requirements for building a robust genomic learning healthcare system for genomic knowledge management in this context, um, I think is unambiguous genotype representation to share this data globally. We have to adopt more standards than are being used today. Things like the variant representation specification, other backend standards, quality metrics for genotype calls that we know when a variant is real or not. Um, also meaningful and standardized phenotype data collection and rare disease that has to rely on human phenotype ontology, but other uh, phenotyping systems as we look across all disorders and longitudinal data interventions and outcomes. Also willing with an infrastructure to share individual level data globally. Sometimes it's not just I want to, but how do I do that? How do I connect? Um, and then reciprocal collaboration as I was really highlighting between the lab and the provider in a much more rigorous back and forth process that can be asynchronous because it's very difficult to get a provider and a lab on a, on a phone call at the same time, for example. How do we do that through perhaps asynchronous methods? Uh, and then that allows us to capture evolving phenotype, build variant level evidence, um, as well as look at what variants we need to analytically validate um, through the system. And I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. I said, <laughs> thank you, Heidi. That was an excellent presentation. And I think we do have a few minutes for some clarifying questions. Carol Bolt, um, who was one of our moderators, asked a question. Carol, do you want to be unmuted and ask directly? Because you had some specific details in there that you might be in the best position to ask. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Um, yeah, so hi, that was that was fantastic. And I one of the things that keeps running through my head um, through some of these talks is um, how we can leverage genome biology for some of these interpretations, and especially the highly structured phenotype genotype data we have from model organism. Um, you, know, you, you mentioned this RBM20 case specifically, and if you look at the phenotypes associated with variants in the mouse, they sound very much like some of the uh, phenotypes observed in patient populations. So for especially for VUSs, where you're you're really looking for all the evidence that you can to functionalize these, how do you see incorporating or maybe better incorporating model organism data into these genomic uh, learning healthcare systems? It's a great question, Carol. And we actually have incorporated in the matchmaker exchange that we do for matching gene to gene, we've incorporated both Monarch and a model, uh, model matcher system. Um, and Monarch brings in, um, as you, you, I'm sure you know, uh, model organism data. And that allows us, um, when we submit a gene, having found a candidate in a human patient, we sometimes will match on a mouse model or, or other organism. Uh, and that can be very helpful to implicate that gene and disease. And I think the same could be true. You have to think about it a slightly different way in terms of how we search for variants, where the homology across um, the 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 genes are not necessarily sufficient to make it worthwhile be, to be searching on a variant, except for very highly conserved genes. So I think it's a slightly different model as we look at the gene, but I will say the matchmaker exchange system is now being used routinely for clinical labs in genomic analysis. Uh, we just had a special issue of human mutation and I asked three of the clinical labs to write papers and they, they alone have impl implicated a thousand novel genes in um, from their routine clinical testing. And that there they're making use of these model organisms in some cases. Most of the matching, I will say, is based on you know human case matching, but 
it, it's there if, the, if there are no human cases. Good question. Great, thanks Heidi. Okay, great. We have some additional questions, but I'm going to um, take the prerogative of the moderator and defer those until the panel discussion because I, we're just a little behind time. And I want to now turn the floor over to Mark Williams, who's going to speak about the creation of a virtuous cycle to realize a genomic learning healthcare system. Great. Thanks very much, Pat. I'm sure most of the people there say, well, wait a second, hasn't Williams presented about 10 times already during this <laughs> meeting? But uh, you give me one more time. Um, so we're going to talk about um, uh, a little bit about what is a virtuous cycle. We've used the term a lot, but we haven't really defined it. Uh, why it's essential to include virtuous cycles in learning healthcare systems and how we might be able to achieve this uh, in genomic medicine. Miriam Webster defines a virtuous cycle as a chain of events in which one desirable occurrence leads to another which further promotes the first occurrence and so on, resulting in a continuous process of improvement. So this, I think, really encapsulates a lot of the themes that we've heard in the presentations about that this is iterative, it's progressive, um, and it's something that really is continuous. It's, it's uh, never done. It's always uh, in motion. Well, I sometimes get really interested in, well, where did this come from? And so I did a little bit of research and it's uh, interesting, at least to me. Mark, Mark, I'm yeah. very sorry to interrupt you, but um, we're not seeing your slides advance. Um, uh, what oh, I see is a screen okay. with like let your me, title. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me try yeah. uh, swapping. Okay. okay, how's that? Yes. Okay, good. So um, fortunately I told you everything that's on the slide so we don't have to go back. Um, so if we talk about the opposite of a virtuous cycle, which is a vicious circle or a vicious cycle, we actually have uh, etymologic origins of that back to the 1700s. And it maybe says something about the human condition that we focus more on the negative than the positive because uh, it really wasn't until the 1950s that the virtuous cycle uh, started to come into, um, uh, into usage, um, which does uh, controvert the, um, uh, invention by Jeff Bezos um, on the back of a napkin in 2001 in which he supposedly uh, introduced this concept. However, um, I do want to emphasize one thing that um, uh, Bezos emphasized uh, when he was defining this is that and that is the role of the customer and I'm going to come back to that uh, in just a second. So we've all seen uh, this uh, from the strategic plan. Uh, it's really exciting to uh, see these virtuous cycles um, being included in the NHGRI strategic plan, but it also points out the idea that this is really an enormous uh, subject. And so in 15 minutes to somehow address everything that's necessary to realize uh, a virtuous cycle in a genomic learning healthcare system is um, uh, essentially a Sisyphean, Sisyphean uh, undertaking. Um, just as saying that is obviously a problem. Um, and so I began to say, how can I uh, really get a handle on this? And as I look back through the agenda uh, and all the focus that we've had on so many different areas over the course of the last two days, I came back to bullet four in Peter Hulick's uh, slide on the elements of an essential um, uh, learning healthcare system for genomics. And that's need the patient voice. Uh, and I recognize that over the course of the uh, time that we've been together, while we've talked about this some, and, and Carol Horowitz had a beautiful presentation on the importance of inclusion, um, that we really haven't spent quite as much time on this as we have in other areas. And so I made the decision to kind of focus uh, the realization of the genomic learning healthcare system on the need for our patient engagement within this. And this is also based on our personal experience, which you've heard me relate earlier in the um, uh, meeting about how I think the success of the Geisinger program has really uh, been informed uh, to a large degree by our early engagement with our patients uh, two years prior to the launch of the program, which has really informed how we developed it. Now, I'm not alone in thinking this. Uh, this is from 2011. And this is from the series of learning healthcare systems uh, that came from the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, patients charting the course. And here's a couple of pull quotes uh, from their summary. Citizen and patient engagement is central to taking advantage of advances 
in the personalization of care based on genetics, preferences, and circumstances. And at present, there's a failure to fully engage patients and the public as active partners in advancing the delivery of care that works best for the circumstances and ensuring that the care delivered is of value. And we can even go back farther. This is something that any of you that have seen me present before have probably seen this slide because I use it uh, a lot. And this is from um, 1987 from Steve Pauker and Jerome Kassir. Personalized medicine is the practice of clinical decision-making such that the decisions made maximize the outcomes that the patient most cares about and minimizes those that the patient fears the most on the basis of as much knowledge about the individual status as available. And I think they really nailed this definition. It's very patient-centered. We have to understand what the patient wants to accomplish from the episode of care and ensure that that happens. And while we're all talking about genomics, um, which is appropriate given the context of our conference, let's not forget that it's not all about genomics, that there's lots of other information uh, that is specific to the patient. Many of the themes that we've already touched on, like socioeconomic status and insurance and other things that can really impair the ability of the patient to achieve the outcomes that they want most. So what I'm gonna do for the remainder of the talk is to take um, the icon from this um, um, and go through the different aspects and just talk a little bit about scholarship, about patient uh, engagement uh, in a genomic virtuous cycle and talk about gaps and opportunities. So the first uh, area is the new, genetic, gen new genomic and clinical knowledge. And so one of the things that a learning healthcare system does is to prioritize translation of knowledge into practice. But we have to use this to identify and uh, address problems that are really defined as important by the patients. It can't just be things we think are interesting. So what that really means is, and again, hearkening back to uh, Carol's presentation, we have to engage patients at proposal initiation to really define key research or clinical questions that are of most importance to the patient. And we have to partner with patients in the analysis and interpretation of research results. Now, this is a, um, a modification of the uh, patient engagement framework, which initially appeared in 2013, that looked at levels of engagement in care and care improvement, looking at consultation, disclosure, involvement, and partnership and shared leadership. And so one of the things that Dan Davis and myself and others at Geisinger did was to say, well, what if we were to apply this continuum of engagement to research, to discovery? So we've heard about consultative models you know, where we inform patients about the discovery activities uh, that utilize patient data. This is really treating patients uh, as uh, more passive receivers of information that we think is going to be good for them. Next up in the continuum is uh, involvement, and this would be consultation. So we use patients as advisors. So perhaps we have an advisory group um, that we also then enable ways that patients can share their data, perhaps have some control over that data sharing. But ultimately we were, where we wanna move to is to have patients partnering with us in our research activities, meaning inclusion of them at the outset of uh, project development as investigators, um, with funding, with protected time uh, as uh, is important uh, and uh, to be involved in all aspects of the projects. And so our uh, default now at Geisinger is really uh, that when you put forward a proposal for research, we have to see evidence that there's substantive involvement of patients at the investigator level at project conception, or we're gonna ask hard questions about why that's not appropriate. The next area is the quality improvement strategies. And as we've heard, um, a lot of what we're drawing in learning healthcare system has come from the world of quality improvement. Uh, and this was the subject of a PCORI topic brief in 2014, where they asked the question, what is the role of patients in quality improvement activities that healthcare systems are engaging in? And what they noted at that time was that there was increased interest in engaging with patients both to identify quality issues and to use the patients as advisors. But at that time, there really was no comparative effectiveness of whether involvement of patients really uh, improved uh, outcomes. 
and or what impact involvement of patients uh, really had. And this was highlighted as a priority research area, um, but there still hasn't been a tremendous amount of scholarship, although there are some areas, um, for example, there is an initiative to reduce um, uh, falls uh, in the uh, inpatient setting. And one of the requirements of that has been to involve uh, patients who have actually fallen in healthcare institutions as part of the improvement team. So I think we're seeing some progress there, but we still need more information about uh, whether this engagement is leading to uh, better uh, quality improvement. The next area is uh, clinical practice innovations. Uh, how do we do things differently? Uh, and there was an interesting systematic review about patient involvement, again, in quality improvement from 2018, where they characterized engagement as low level unidirectional consultation that would result in discrete products. So this is again, more than engagement model where we come up with something and we sort of impose it uh, on you. In contrast to high level engagement where patients are involved in the co-design or partnership strategies that really led to substantive changes in care process and structural outcomes. Now, again, there wasn't a lot of data to crunch to say, are we really demonstrating improvement in efforts that use high level engagement with patients in quality improvement? But it was clear that patients were resentful of being treated as tokens or just in consultation after decisions had already been made. So if we look at it from a satisfaction perspective, I think there's a very clear signal that this is not an appropriate level of engagement from the patient's perspective. But again, there are more opportunities for research. If we move on to the next, outcomes data collection, um, it's important to recognize that patient-centeredness is one of the six domains of quality as defined by the now the National Academy of Medicine. Um, and we are starting to see more uh, inclusion of patient-centered outcomes uh, into quality measures that are being used by um, uh, CMS and the National Center for Quality Assurance. Um, we recognize that there needs to be standardized outcomes for genomic medicine. Um, uh, and that um, was identified through several NHGRI funded projects. But we also need to have patient informed outcomes. Um, and for the most part in genomic medicine, these are undefined. It's interesting to see how other fields have addressed this. There's at least one major orthopedics journal that says if you are going to submit an article to us with um, patient outcomes, the, the outcomes have to be defined by patients and you have to use measurement tools that are um, uh, validated uh, patient reported outcome tools. In other words, you can't, as a physician, or uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, other healthcare professionals say, well, it looked like the patient improved to us, and that's what we're measuring. And so I think we need to develop those in genomic medicine. So again, you're seeing a recurring theme here. There are lots of opportunities for research. And this is the Proctor implementation research methods. And I just, again, want to show uh, that there are several patient-related outcomes that are reflected here. Patient-centeredness, uh, satisfaction, function symptomatology, which should be defined from the perspective of the patient. So, uh, and then uh, implementation strategies involving interventional providers, consumers. So it's not that I'm telling you anything new here. Moving on to data analysis and interpretation, I think it's a logical assumption that patient involvement would improve interpretation and relevance of findings. And it was interesting to look at uh, the mental health area because we're beginning to see some best practices in uh, mental health that are beginning to incorporate uh, patient involvement in uh, analysis of data. This has not been systematically studied in genomic medicine. I wanted to show you a table from this Jennings paper that I've cited that I thought was quite interesting. Um, here it shows in the preparation phase, ensure there are people with lived experience uh, in the research team, uh, recruit a heterogeneous genius uh, patient public involvement co-researcher group. In the co-production of the coding framework, um, clarify the study aims, explain the co-researcher role and why their input is valued. This is a training aspect. We can't expect people just to come ready to go. Uh, we have to involve training and education to help them uh, to uh, be able to fulfill this role. Um, and there should be uh, ongoing exercises relating to this 
uh, including um, feedback exercises. And then ultimately, um, you know, the, um, I, I might disagree a bit with this. They say the research team should amend preliminary framework on the basis of co-researcher contributions. That to me seems a little bit less uh, engaged than I might have framed it, but I think the concept is essentially sound. Uh, and then to make sure that you use a broader group of co-researchers for additional comment uh, and do this. So I think this is a model that is uh, quite interesting. So we've zoomed through uh, a lot uh, in a very short time here. So uh, I, I think my work here is done. Oh, wait a second. Um, there is one more thing. Um, and this is something that I um, pur purposely hid from the initial slide on this patients charting the course. This is another pull quote that I think is extremely important. In health systems, provider preferences and supply often shape the care delivered. So this is the reality that we all live in, is that as much as we like to talk a good game about engagement, at the end of the day, um, our new changes um, much more frequently involve clinician preferences and system preferences. And so we need to be very cognizant that um, all of these roles and, and the role of the patient is essential and we can't subsume that to what we may think as clinicians are the best. What that ultimately means is, is that this is an exercise in cultural change. And so if you want to develop a, a learning healthcare system in genomics or anything else, you really have to do a cultural assessment and be ready for a cultural change because it's not tweaking business as usual. It's really a complete uh, reimagination of how we uh, do things. And so. I think if we go into it with the idea that this is a cultural transformation, uh, we're much more likely to be uh, uh, successful. And with that, I'll end. Okay, well, thanks, Mark. Um, I just wanted to maybe comment on a, a few things that I'm seeing in the chat. Um, Kareem Watson uh, says that there's a, a lot of opportunity to learn from best practices in community-based participatory research, which has been a big emphasis, for example, on the CTSAs. And Sharon Terry from the Genetic Alliance said that they, um, she worked on a project where they actually created a tool to measure whether true engagement is being done and she provided a link there. So I guess my question is, you know, I know you've done work funded by PCORI, um, people have been talking about patient engagement in research um, and engagement of the public. Do you think there's anything specific about genomic medicine that requires a unique approach for the, how we engage patients? Or can we pretty much take advantage of the lessons learned from, let's say, the work done by PCORI? Um, I think there's uh, a lot that can be used from prior work. I don't think we need to um, uh, reinvent the wheel. Um, I think that there's also um, uh, a possibility that there are going to be unique aspects uh, to genomics uh, that uh, we do need to um, address. Again, I think some of the things that I've heard in uh, previous, um, thank you, Sharon, um, uh, <laughs> that we've seen in um, uh, previous uh, talks is the idea that, you know, there, is, there are some differences about genomic data. It persists, it needs to travel with the patient. And so I think there's some really interesting uh, engagement opportunities that go over and above what we might expect to see in other programs where perhaps you can delimit uh, the uh, encounter to an episode of care or one specific um, issue like a fall or a medication, um, an inappropriate medication use, something of that nature. Uh, nature. Uh, here, I think there's some really interesting questions that address the whole idea about interoperability that would be fascinating to get a patient perspective on. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so to keep us moving along now, um, I'm gonna uh, introduce our next speaker and Jeff Ginsberg is gonna bring us home by talking about scaling the genomics enabled learning health system to optimize research and clinical care. Great, um, so uh, again, thanks Pat and Terry for uh, for having this great meeting, um, also for inviting me to share my thoughts uh, about uh, really scaling um, genomic-enabled learning health systems to the to a national platform, 
And it's fair to say what I've seen here in the past two days, and when I think about scaling, is that um, we really have, um, this is the problem statement. If you've seen one genomics learning health system, you've seen one genomics learning health system. And the reason why I say that is obvious, um, health systems are different. They serve different communities and demographics and the architecture and the domain expertise. Uh, it certainly has been different as we've seen many different types of genomic learning, genomic enabled learning health systems over the last uh, couple of days and what they've implemented. Um, Mark has have shown you this vision. I'm not gonna belabor this, I'm gonna skip this slide, but I'm, I'm interested in sharing with you um, at least one version of this that came from Charles Friedman, who's been a guru in this area. Um, and this is his notion of the same idea. On the left hand side is a, is a system, which like most academic systems uh, teaches, but really does not learn. And on the right hand side um, is a system that learns as it, um, it teaches as it learns by assembling data, by analyzing data, by many elements of the cycle, of the virtuous cycle that, um, that Mark just uh, went into uh, quite ele elegantly. And it also takes the further step of delivering results and monitoring changes as they occur um, in the context of that delivery. Now, when I was um, uh, in 2015, I was a co-chair of the then Institute of Medicine Roundtable on Genomics and Precision Health with Sharon Terry. And I was also the co-organizer with Sam Shekhar, the chief, then the chief information officer at Northrop Grumman um, on a workshop that you've seen highlighted here many times. And uh, not to be repetitive, but I, I really just wanna um, emphasize three thrusts that came out of that, that workshop because I, I believe they're really foundational and form the basis for the scalability of learning health systems. And the first, um, as we talked about yesterday, is the interoperability of electronic health records. If we don't have systems that can talk to one another, they cannot scale. And as we heard yesterday as well, there's been significant progress in this area with um, the integration of clinical genomic data um, in, in workflows. Uh, there's the workshop uh, in 2015 supported regulatory incentives to drive interoperability. This was really um, interesting to see how meaningful use drove the um, uh, uptake of electronic health records, uh, electronic health records, but it hasn't really come the full cycle of interoperability. And we've seen through efforts of GA4GH and um, HL7, the ability to create gen genomic uh, standards for data so that they can flow. Um, and we've also seen demonstration projects uh, such as through Emerge and Ignite and HDRI funded projects that can actually be used to demonstrate um, the transferability of, of, of tools from one um, health system to another. The second area, which we also um, discussed yesterday and was the subject of a part of a workshop that Ken and Mark ran uh, last year is the clinical notion of clinical decision support. And uh, again, um, I think tremendous um, progress has been made in this area. Um, creating stores of clinical decision support, particularly in the eMERGE program that can be shared across different groups. And um, the IGNITE network is actually doing it, clinical trials that are testing the hypothesis that clinical decision support information can actually uh, drive changes in clinical outcomes. And the last area, um, which um, as Daryl indicated, we might be falling a little short, but are making progress in our building platforms that, are, um, that use FAIR principles, uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, um, but the areas that, and then Mark even alluded to this, is that we're, we're falling uh, short on are, are really engaging the public and our patients um, to create a donor culture. And this is something that Terry, I think, mentioned in some of her summative comments uh, this morning. Uh, we've also not seen um, a lot of use of patient provided information um, into healthcare. And therein lie some important gaps in phenotypic information, for sure, electronic health records being. Uh, clearly sporadic in the information they provide. And the integration of the learning health systems with other data stores that can actually uh, provide useful information about genomic variants as, high, as Heidi uh, emphasized uh, a little earlier in this session. So the question is, can we create a national um, scalable genomic learning healthcare system? And I was um, pleased to learn uh, recently of a national learning healthcare system that could be a model for one for this, for us in the genomics field. Uh, this one um, is run out of the National Institute for Mental Health, and it's, um, it's, it's on early psychosis uh, and intervention. It's an early psychosis intervention network. The acronym is EPINET, and you can see the vision here is to accelerate 
advances in early psychosis care recovery outcomes and scientific discovery to a national early psychosis learning healthcare partnership, which seems if we change the words might actually emulate the vision that we would like to achieve um, in genomics. And um, this was initiated in 2019. Susan Azrin, who is um, mentioned on this slide, is in the audience. I've asked her to attend today if there are potentially questions around uh, EpiNet. And EpiNet um, actually is um, a main strategies, I believe, align with many of ours, the coordination facilitation of data sharing. In this case, uh, EpiNet took uh, 101 existing early psychosis clinics and, um, and galvanized them in the context of a national data coordinating center. Uh, they've driven the curation uh, and harmonization of various measures and data elements. There is a um, uniform or, um, or attempting to have a uniform healthcare informatics strategy. Um, there's emphasis on practice-based research and, of course, the dissemination of their findings uh, to a broader uh, clinical and participant community. Uh, they've standardized, the, the coordinating center in particular has enabled the standardization of measures, um, the unification of informatics approaches, um, and the mechanisms for sharing rapid tools, and, and they've created a culture, or at least aspire to create a culture of collaborative research with participation between academic um, uh, uh, researchers as well as community uh, practices. And their, uh, I think their goals also align again with ours in delivering more uh, personalized and precise treatments to do quality improvement projects um, in the health systems that they're interacting with, to do rapid uh, piloting and of, of innovative approaches, and um, also to enhance their statistical pow the power to um, um, to uh, uh, detect rare uh, events. So um, I've asked Susan for some information about what has happened since 2019, since you know the pandemic, uh, notwithstanding. But they've been successful in implementing a core assessment battery across the network, which um, again has the standardized measures being used by uh, the clinics and, and then coordinated by the, uh, by the data coordinating center. They've initiated a variety of quality improvement programs and shared learnings. Um, as, a, as we've been discussing, the patient self-reported measures are now being implemented into routine care. And the research community has identified gaps that, that they're using, to, um, that gaps in research that are the basis for further proposals for funding. Um, and even some of the outcomes measures to date have influenced the decision-making of local state mental health commissioners. So this is quite, at least, um, I think, um, uh, positive. And uh, I think it, we should be optimistic that, uh, that a national network could have um, uh, impact. What would we do um, in the genomics community? We've already identified a number of um, amazing stakeholders that have taken this on, many of which have shared their systems with us um, in this meeting. Uh, but the other stakeholders that we need to engage as we talked about earlier today are the patient advocacy groups, foundations, um, even um, uh, industry, uh, um, um, industry groups that are providing genetic tests and the, and the CDC. It could be that the NHGRI could seed a coordinating center whose goals would be to share data with and gather data from genomics medical clinic, clinical genomics programs nationwide and to support genomic medicine in practice, quality improvement, and benchmarking. So um, what would a research platform uh, look like? Uh, this is the, the left hand of the virtuous cycle for a genomics um, learning health system. Of course, I'm a little biased that perhaps the All of Us research program uh, is one possibility uh, to be that platform. As you know, this is a longitudinal population study aiming to recruit 1 million people from across the United States. We've consented our 500,000th participant in June, and uh, the core of the program is in a, is in a, a public, uh, an accessible data platform uh, that we call the All of Us Research Workbench or All of Us Research Hub. These are data from, uh, from June of this year. Um, we have th over 370,000 survey responses, physical measurements on over 300,000 individuals, electronic health record data from over 250,000, uh, this March, we released the first um, tranche of genomic data with 165,000 arrays and nearly 100,000 whole genomes. And there's also um, uh, wearable technology data that's um, available to research uh, on the workbench. And we, as, as we discussed yesterday about diversity in, and the gap in genomic data, data sets, I want to just emphasize the commitment that all of us has had to reducing this gap. In fact, we're intentionally overrepresenting minority populations in our cohort. Here's the data we are recruiting from 
all 50 states in the United States with a, um, a, a larger footprint of enrollment and in the Southwest and in some of the Northeastern states. Uh, we hope to um, make that more homogeneous for the middle of the country. Less than 50% of our participants identify as white. 80% are from underrepresented um, populations in biomedical research. And you can see some of the categories on the right-hand side that, that, that we use to classify this in terms of age, races and ethnicity, sexual orientation, income, geography, rural versus urban, et cetera. So, so really um, this could be an, an amazing uh, potential resource for, for um, uh, discovery findings as it pertains to the underrepresented populations that will be served by some of the health systems that um, we've been uh, discussing over the last two days. And of course, uh, the vision for the All of Us Research Program on the left-hand side is to accelerate, accelerate research and health, um, sorry, accelerate health research and medical breakthroughs, and on the right-hand side, enabling individualized prevention, treatment, and care. Um, we, so the the All of Us program effectively embraces this virtual, virtual cycle as its vision. And from my perspective, it makes a, a learning cohort uh, deriving mechanistic insights from clinical data that we're gathering and driving those back to impact for uh, its participants. And just this month, we began, uh, we initiated our health-related return of results using the ACMG panel, as well as seven uh, pharmacogenes. And uh, we're really excited about the, the forward movement of our data moving into the clinic. All of us could be a research engine for a national genomic enabled learning healthcare system by virtue of its scale and its diversity and accessibility it could jumpstart uh, research findings from a, from a network of learning health systems and also gather new data from such a network. So um, this is potentially a view of the, the big picture today across the United States. We have genomic enabled learning healthcare systems across the nation. They're operating independently. Um, arguably that many of them are siloed, although we heard some great examples earlier today from the VA as well as from uh, Intermountain Health. Um, but uh, there's an opportunity perhaps to create a future state um, where um, there's national coordination. And that's the thing that I, I have sensed over the last couple of days that we're really lacking is a coordinated effort to bring the learning healthcare system learnings it, um, that we've heard about and really galvanize a community that could actually um, do things uh, together than rather as uh, independent operators. It would be bi-directional flow of standards and information and a genomic learning health system uh, you know, will uh, address several of the challenges we've, we've, we've talked about over the last couple of days. It will enable rapid learning and implementation and outcomes research it will be enabled by standardization of quality and evaluation metrics. It will ena be enabled by the standardization of implementation frameworks. It should catalyze research on rare and common diseases, environmental and drug response mechanisms. It could fill um, uh, critical gaps in training um, that have been highlighted over the last couple of days. So this could be a broad platform for trainees and more homogenized training if that's desirable. And it's a, a, a source of dissemination of knowledge of various types. It will engage providers um, who are super interested in delivering cutting edge genomic assessments and also delivering greater quality of care. And it will uh, engage participants, particularly with um, return results and other values. Um, and then we talked about sustainability early today. So the partnership opportunities with genomic and diagnostic companies, electronic health record vendors, and as we discussed a, a, an hour or so ago with insurers could be quite powerful. So to end, um, you know, looking at success through the lens of a scalable national uh, genomic enabled learning healthcare system. Um, if we did this, we would have hopefully see a vibrant community of national health system, learning health systems implementing genomic information and uh, integrating tools into their workflows. Um, health and data flow um, will allow us to um, provide outcome measures that will be um, critically important for more universal adoption, guideline uptake, and coverage decisions, as we talked about earlier. Um, this would also enable uh, the flow of data to create an accessible research platform that enables novel findings, validation of prior findings uh, nationally or internationally, and the development of a genomic knowledge repository that can be used by not only learning health systems, but other health systems across the country. And importantly, um, the diversity of this is, um, uh, should be a top priority. So it should, should be available to and serve all people. And in terms of sustainability, I think we would all agree 
that the ultimate goal for genomic medicine is that it is medicine and not a separate um, a, a separate area for uh, for both insurers, providers, patients, and participants. So with that, I will thank you and happy to participate in the panel discussion. Thanks again. Great, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, I don't see any clarifying questions in the chat right now. So I'm gonna take this time since Su you mentioned Susan Azrin by name. And if she's here, I would be happy to give her the opportunity to weigh in and provide some additional perspective um, on EpiNet. Is Susan here? Can you hear me? There she yes. is. Yes, yay, yeah. perfect. Well, 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 thank you so much. Um, First, Jeff, for inviting me, uh, reaching out to me, um, it's uh, it's really an, an honor uh, to to be here. I'm I am a, a clinical psychologist by training. My area is mental health services research um, at the NIMH. So this is an entirely new world for me in genomics, and I'm really learning a lot. And even though we have launched our our own learning healthcare system around early psychosis. Um, you folks um, have some fabulous ideas and have gone into um, you know some some pretty uh, sophisticated stuff in some areas that that we haven't um, we haven't got to yet. So I, I'm learning so much on both the genomics and it's informing my ideas on learning health system. Um, so I, I want to say that. Um, it, it, a, a couple of areas that especially resonated with me are Mark, uh, Mark Williams' uh, talk and Carol Horowitz um, talking about the stakeholders and the importance of their engagement and how to engage them. And um, I, uh, I agreed you know, uh, with, I think, everything they said and couldn't um, emphasize enough the importance of the engagement at you know, multiple levels, both the local level, engaging patients and providers in the actual settings where you're deploying your learning health system, as well as the national level where you want to engage advocacy organizations, payers, and, 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 and so on. And uh, our EpiNet grew out of uh, a very successful uh, National Institute of Mental Health Initiative um, involving a team-based multi-element treatment for young people with early psychosis and the effectiveness of that strategy and uh, the um, stakeholder engagement among payers and advocacy groups and, and, and many others to created this you know, national buzz essentially that led to huge congressional funding for these early psychosis treatment programs across the country. Like before our, our initiative, there were a handful of these programs and then um, with the effectiveness um, uh, demonstrated through a clinical trial of this coordinated specialty care for early psychosis uh, went from a handful of programs to then hundreds of programs across the US. And that is what, um, create the opportunity for EpiNet. There are all these ex excited, motivated uh, programs. If we could bring them together into this network and you know, leverage um, this, this tremendous expansion, um, we could create a learning health system. So it, it's sort of like it both started at the grassroots with these small local programs, but it never could have happened without, without that engagement uh, at, at a national and regional level of, of the advocacy organizations, of payers, of our federal partners. Yes. Um, so this, this idea, um, I think if I'm articulating it correctly, that Carol um, Horowitz mentioned of uh, when you're engaging the, the stakeholders, um, you know, we want to be with them you know, learning with them, right. um, making decisions right. with them, not just approaching them, yeah, what can you tell me that, that uh, might, be, might be helpful. And the, uh, I think the strategy that, that um, we tried to use um, that, that was effective is you just first start out with what are their major problems, which hopefully right. 
um, you have a little um, insight into at the start when you meet with them. And then, um, so rather than selling them on the idea of your fabulous learning health system from the start, it's just, how is this going to help them? Right. With right. their with their problems. And, and it was very different when we were talking to the Social Security Administration or the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration or the National Alliance Mental Illness. They all have very, very different needs. And so we just start with that as the common ground. And then, so of course that, what they shared about their problems helped us inform what needed to go into the learning healthcare system. And, you know, we're, we're the NIH. And, and so we're you know, like a knowledge generating entity. You know, we, we're all about scientific discovery at every level. Um, so what is the knowledge that our learning healthcare system can, can produce that there's gonna be actionable for decision makers, right? Right. So, yeah. I mean, there's as as we've seen um, from all the presentations and the beautiful slides of the learning healthcare system. Learning <laughs> learning healthcare systems are have so many moving parts because we you know our goals are to generate the information that improves patient care at the individual patient level. So what you know what's actionable at that point for the patient and the clinician, and then what's the information that's actionable. Uh, for healthcare systems who make you know decisions sometimes about what to pay for, um, uh, uh, what to offer, what services to offer, what information you know is is actionable for payers, for insurers. I'm part of a whole another work group that um, is focused on financing of of this intervention, coordinated specialty care for early psychosis because it's um, the the. the coverage of it by by insurance is mm -hmm. really uneven and in, in public health systems and you know for the most part not covered at all by commercial insurance so i i um i i think i'll i'll, I'll stop there okay that's great yeah no that was very go very on good. with many other uh, uh yeah. thoughts that have been uh, elicited from these wonderful presentations but yeah. uh, i'll just yeah. stop thank you for that opportunity Absolutely, absolutely. And thank you, Jeff, for inviting Susan and for sharing this with us. I mean, it's clear that we, we don't need to start with blank sheets of paper for any of these things, that we should be looking for where there are examples of systems like EpiNet. And so that's really um, helpful. So I'm going to, we only have a few minutes now. We, um, we went a little longer for the panel discussion, but I do want to make sure that I, I get a chance to have the panelists respond to some of the questions that have been asked. Um, by our attendees. Okay, so the first one I think is um, directed at Heidi and it's from Mary Relling and Heidi, it says great, um, well, she, besides she's complimenting you. She says, I think some folks think that we can use such individual reports to generate new pharmacogenomics data for common feed and types. And this would require a lot of caution and is not the best way to go. Um, and so she's asking, I think, about sort of the applicability of some of your recommendations for germline diseases around pharmacogenomics. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I, I did answer in the chat oh, or the okay. Q&A oh. thing, but, but I think it's a, a valuable point in that when we're dealing with more common phenotypes or common variants, where you're finding these variants in both you know, the general population and in your test population, then you really need, and the phenotypes are not, you know, it's like breast cancer, you know, lots of people have breast cancer. Uh, so the prior probability of the association between a variant in that gene and what's known about the gene to phenotype relationship is not tight, it's not specific. In those cases, you really have to use a, a well run case control study. That's certainly true of pharmacogenomic associations. And that would also be true of a lot of the uh, cancer genes, other genes associated with more common rare phenotypes. It, however, in a lot of rare disease, you know, about over half of the diagnoses we make, the variant is actually unique to the family mm -hmm. and is absent from the entire global population, or at least all those sequenced, which is not the entire population. So we can, we can more easily use that data when we're talking about rare or absent variants from the general population and use that gene to phenotype relationship to inform the evidence, but, it, but it's a very different game than in pharmacogenomics. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks for that answer. Um, I see another question here for um, Mark and it, uh, the, Megan Haley asked you, Mark, that 
Although she's supportive of the idea of the need for patient engagement and patient informed outcomes, she's concerned that sometimes the outcomes patients care about aren't necessarily the outcomes payers are willing to pay for. For example, in a rare disease, a diagnosis doesn't necessarily change outcomes, but can be hugely beneficial to the family. How do we address this disconnect? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. In, uh, in full disclosure, I did spend five years as an associate medical director of a provider-owned health plan. So this is a, a, a question that is uh, actually quite practical, and, and the range is very large. We uh, see things like people that have uh, a, uh, some type of a rheumatic disease uh, that says, well, we would like health insurance to pay for a hot tub. There's no question that the hot tub would improve their quality of life, but it's not something that would traditionally be considered a benefit of health insurance. Now, that's kind of an absurd example, but it gives the idea of what's the balance between personal utility and utility that is of enough value to a larger population that it could be considered to be covered uh, under insurance. And I think the one that the example that was used by the person asking the question is spot on. Um, I, I, I really am mystified by uh, the reluctance of uh, payers to pay for diagnosis because to those of us in medicine, diagnosis is the foundation for everything that we do. And I would argue that um, uh, we're probably the only specialty where um, we're being scrutinized because we're trying to make a diagnosis and we're not paying for that. And some of it has to do with the fact that we're Johnny come lately's and that our tests up until relatively recently have been quite expensive. But the reality is, is that, you know, and I do this when I present to insurers, as I say, look, most insurers or many insurers uh, aren't prior authorizing MRIs. Um, and yet if you use MRIs for developmental disability, uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, the diagnostic yield on them is uh, less than 5% and it almost never changes the, the treatment. Yet that goes through, whereas an equivalent test of genome sequencing that's about the same cost has a diagnostic yield of 60%, and in about 30% of the time, if not more, it changes care. So we've gotten ourselves into a dilemma regarding this diagnostic realm. And I think that's an, uh, 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 an argument we have to continue to say is that this is foundational to medicine. You can't do a treatment without a diagnosis. But the, you can't also a priori say that, well, because we don't think there's going to be a treatment, we shouldn't allow an attempt to diagnose. So, uh, yeah, much better. We need to do a much better job of communicating on that. And we need a much better range of treatments so that uh, we can actually have more things that we can offer our patients. Great. Does anybody else on the panel want to weigh in on that? I, I'll just emphasize what, what Mark's points are and say that the cost that is continually incurred by these families for non-genetic evaluations over time for things like MRIs and many metabolic panels, different specialists, neurologists, cardiologists, you know, they're trying to get any sort of answer. And those services are being paid for in many cases, even though the genetic testing may not, but the ability to end that diagnostic odyssey that is incredibly costly um, is should be viewed as an economic gain. Yeah, and, and I, one of our speakers, and maybe it was you, Mark, um, or another person, I mean, all of the work that was done to talk about the cost effectiveness of genomic sequencing in the NICU, that was really essentially truncating the diagnostic odyssey and avoiding that long period to diagnosis so that there could be a decision to treat or withdraw treatment, et cetera. So I think that is an example of where, and payers are caring about, um, you know, uh, avoiding the that type of diagnostic odyssey, at least with these acutely ill children, uh, babies. Yeah, and I think um, Nancy probably has some interesting uh, perception. Uh, uh, insightful, I think, was a word that she used for me. So I, I will return, return the compliment. <laughs> well, if if I may, I mean, uh, I agree with everything you guys have said, and I think it's also um, their implementation barriers. Um, 
you know, United Healthcare pays for exome sequencing for anybody really that doesn't have a diagnosis. But often it's not done when a patient is in the hospital because the bills are part of a DRG and the hospitals won't allow people to do the testing. So uh, it's a yes and is what I is what I would say. I also think we need some health economic um, studies that show that ending the diagnostic odyssey you know, reduces morbidity, mortality, and saves costs. And then finally, the other thing I would add is there is value above and beyond an answer, right? And saving costs. There's the value to the other family members. There's a value to connecting people with community. There's a, there's, it goes on and on. So, and it's also an equity. It's, you know, people who are on a uh, diagnostic odyssey are often people with developmental disabilities or have physical disabilities, and it's an equity issue. Great. Okay. Um, there's one uh, question here from Crystal Sosi, and I'll ask Jeff to take it initially, and then if others want to comment, she's asking how much information related to Indigenous data sovereignty is imparted to providers of potential Indigenous research participants interested in all of us? Yeah, thanks for that question. I'm, I'm, I just want to make sure I understand it um, as, as you're asking it. Could you just, uh, would you mind asking the question um, live? Sure. So I uh, encounter a lot of Indigenous tribal members mm -hmm. who uh, may want to enroll in the Elevus Research Program or other research studies, and they are um, requesting their providers to sign off on HIPAA releases to enable the sharing of their EHR data with, with the program mm -hmm. and other studies. And uh, for members that are clearly from a single tribal nation, um, that request obviously goes, filters through their community, but, um, and particularly for care related to IHS, but, or Indian Health Services. The question is related more for urban indigenous patients and, and research participants, especially considering that that's where the All of Us Research Program is uh, largely recruits as urban-based Native Americans. And I just want to um, have an understanding of the pathway by which um, data sharing education and indigenous data sovereignty is imparted at all these different points in which a provider who wants to recommend um, just any types of, of genomic care or participation in these studies is actually imparting those data sharing risks onto uh, urban native individuals. Great, great um, question. And uh, I may call on Kareem who's here um, from the program to, to help me with the answer. But first, um, uh, we do have a significant number. I don't know the exact number of uh, American Indian, Alaska native participants in the program to date. We've been um, very um, careful and thoughtful about the privacy of their, their data. So um, they may share their data with the program right now, but it has not been released to the researcher community uh, what, um, who uh, are um, indigenous people and who are not. Uh, that um, is, a, is a process we're going through right now to make decisions about releasing that data and how um, we protect um, the privacy concerns of the individuals involved. Um, and Kareem, do you want to comment on the, on Crystal's question about the provider, uh, if you know the answer? Sure. Thank you so much, Jeff, and thank you so much for that question, Crystal. As 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 Jeff said, right now we are being very cautious. First, I want to note that before we did any AIA and engagement, we actually completed tribal consultations with all the leaders of all the tribes. So all of the engagement that we're doing, um, to, I'm sorry, Chris, you shaking. Oh, it wasn't with all the tribes. You well, um, did engagement at six different sites, with, with, but that wasn't all 574 tribal nations. Well, thank you. With, with the tribal leaders, excuse me, with, with, the, with many of the tribal leaders. And we can I can follow up with you on that from that tribal report. And that from that tribal report, we have been intentional not, about not doing, first of all, any recruitment on tribal, tribal land and any engagement we do with AIAN participants, those are participants who are free to, uh, to enroll in the program. And if they self-identify as AIAN, we've been very careful to not release that information until further guidance has come out in terms of that data release.
Does anyone else, oh, Crystal, do you have your hand up? Did you want to comment on that? Yeah, no, I appreciate the pointing to the report. I've read the report. The question is not about release of data. Mm -hmm. um, the question is more about collection of data. Um, and yes, I understand that there's no recruitment effort specifically on tribal lands, mm -hmm. but I do know a large recruitment site is in, for instance, with U of A in Tucson, Arizona, mm -hmm. which does, um, that medical system does um, care for a lot of urban native individuals. So in when they are seeking care at this site and also other banner health sites, for instance, in, in, in the region, um, and are informed about the program from a participant viewpoint, if they're interested, they're also asked to, to provide a HIPAA release from their providers. Now, my question is how much provider education is given in terms of imparting those data sharing risks and, um, um, and also risks related to re-identification due to being a member of a small minority re-identifiable population? Great, I better understand your question now. Thank you for that. Um, we, we're doing some, but we could definitely do more in, in that space. And But one of the things, that's why, the, that's why I tied my answer to data release, because it's that data release that could allow that re-identification. And so that's why I tied it to that piece. And so I can ad address it, and I think there was a, um, another, uh, question in the in the panel about that, but uh, the most important piece is that the release of that data is the holding up of the release of that data is why we're holding that up because we want to make sure that there's enough provider su sufficient provider training that goes along with that. So we're okay. doing some, but we could do more. Okay, great. Now this is a really important conversation, and I hate to be the person that has to be the timekeeper as well, but we did want to make sure that we left time for uh, discussion of the solutions, as I've mentioned. And so uh, although all of us are getting sort of tired, I'm just going to encourage if you could just stay to the end, because this is where hopefully we're going to take all of your great input and make sure that we can actually come up with some really good recommendations for, for solutions to move forward. So the format that we're going to use is Terry is going to go through in chronological order the takeaways from each of our panel discussions with really just you saw some of this from the first three sessions this morning. You haven't seen it for the last for the today's sessions, but we're really just going to ask you to weigh in and say, did we misrepresent anything that, that you think is an important potential solution or did we miss anything that's a potential solution? So I'm going to ask Renee to help me monitor the chat and hand raising um, because Terry's going to be going through the slides. Great. Um, thank you so much, Pat. And thank you, everyone, um, for, for your comments. And I know it's it's late in the day. I only have 40 slides, so it shouldn't take long. Um, so now you can see how many slides I have. I'm going to leave it in this view. Uh, can you see the Genomic LHS Day 1 brief recap? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and of course, I didn't fix that. So brief recap um, of both. Uh, so you've seen these points before. One of the things that, that we thought would be helpful would be to try to highlight some of the places among the solutions where we might be able to develop some collaborations. And so that's what this uh, teal light, uh, cyan, I guess it is, um, uh, board of uh, bold um, uh, print is about. Uh, and yet, you know, before going into that, just to, just to let you know that um, solutions that that we kind of pulled out of this, and many thanks to Renee and Pat and to the moderators who sent me their their notes. Um, again, uh, uh, some potential solutions in the laying the groundwork, you know, setting up genomic uh, learning healthcare systems. Uh, the data donor culture is something that uh, that we continually work on, but could do better at. Uh, the dashboard of clinical management steps is a, is a real step forward, um, uh, particularly compared to uh, where we were in 2015, and uh, it seems like something that uh, uh, we should try to expand and, and share with other groups, uh, because it really is critical to effective implementation and uptake in, within a healthcare system. Uh, improving integration of measures of uh, structural discrimination or structural racism that goes beyond racism to other forms of discrimination and social determinants of health um, is something I think that everyone agreed on. And of course, sharing educational content across organizations, and we do have some uh, efforts at that. I had mentioned the ISCC 
uh, for, for traditional education in Genoans, but there may be others. So with that, let me ask, do these capture at least some of the, of the uh, solutions that we heard? Are there other critical ones that we'd like to add or do you want to modify any of these? Pat Renee, please moderate that. Not seeing any hands raised. Um, so it looks like people are pretty much in agreement and obviously they got to see them earlier today as well and maybe think about them. Okay, great. All right, I'll, I'll go on then uh, again on the IT infrastructure. It seemed as though um, genomic health information exchanges uh, to add on to health information exchanges uh, might be a place where collaboration would be possible. Um, as, as well as disseminating um, uh, data standards, which GA4GH is doing quite effectively, as well as other groups. And then another place for collaboration, expand or extend uh, the interop interoperability studies that, that have uh, uh, been shown that Peter uh, uh, described, uh, facilitating data sharing and expanding, expanding training. But uh, do these two areas, genomic health information exchanges and um, uh, expand uh, interoperability studies, do those seem like logical places for collaboration? We'll all speak at once. So of course I can't see who's who's raising yeah, their hands. Um, so uh, I, I mean, no, go ahead. No, yeah, I will definitely let you know if somebody raises their if hand. Who raises their hand? I, I was just going to say, well, since I can't see if anybody's raising their hand, <laughs> and there's silence, um, I, I, I'm going to. Uh, Mark just people. raised his hand. Oh, okay, great, Mark. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just relating to the genomic health information exchange, I, I would just include that um, there may be some policy implications about genomic data. So it's, it's a lot of it, of course, is informatic standards. Uh, but there may be some specific issues relating to policy and regulation that would also need to be incorporated in that. Um, oh, no, still Mark. Okay, great. And in terms of the interoperability um, issue, I, I may ask those who are are heavily involved in, in medical record and electronic health records and that. Are, is this something that can be done in other settings? We've tried to do it in the Emerge Network, for example, in other places. Nobody's, nobody's going to uh, stick out their neck on that one, so. This is hard to do in a, in a Zoom format, but we'll do our best. Yeah. Um, so, so Terry, you know, it's yeah. one thing to, it's uh, a lot of standards are disseminated. I think the, right. the thing is to get them uh, adopted, right? Because mm -hmm. because uh, you have 15 different groups, you'll have 15 different standards. Um, so I, yeah, I think they're at least on a handful of, of standards for, um, how to organize and annotate and structure these data um, is going to be important. So, yeah, no, thanks, Carol. That's an excellent point. I, re I remember that the former deputy director of the NLM when, when uh, Betsy Humphreys, when we were talking about standards and she said, you know, the problem, exactly what she said, the problems we have too many. When, when we say, you know, we need to, to adopt standards, everyone says, sure, they can use ours, you know? <laughs> exactly like right. Yes, yes. And you're right back where you started. Exactly. Yeah, but there are some opportunities for collaboration here because as we've heard, uh, there are groups like the HL7 Genomics uh, Working Group uh, and GA4GH uh, that are developing uh, normative standards that could be incorporated. So we don't want to be the one that's developing our own standards. I think we should that's, take advantage of those. That That's right. And I, I but I think it's important to, to recognize those ones that are mature enough and robust enough to be uh, adopted widely versus uh, what's what are the gaps for standards that we still have where there might not be something like uh, HL7 in place. And then we also have a, a comment from Nephi. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so I was uh, just going to say, um, 
I think one of the things we, we try, did a lot of, when I was at Geisinger previously, we did a lot of work in this area. And I think we need to identify all of the stakeholders in terms of who, where this data is going to be used. I mean, ultimately, I'd love to have people's genomic data on their smartphone so it can go to the other system. We're having, here at Intermountain Healthcare, we're right next door to University of Utah. We share a lot of patients, but we don't have a way to share genetic data. And so identifying the different stakeholders, which is, you know, your laboratory systems, your EMRs, and, you know, even ways to, to share that with the patient, and then engaging them in some way that encourages them to adopt standards. I also know that one of the things that has held up the adoption is worries about maturity. And um, it, the, the problem with even the standards groups is, is genomic data is sort of a, it's not necessarily static in that I think if we try to model too much in the standards, then we'll never get there. We need to, to set it at a granular level and then say, this is where we're gonna go and, and move forward. But identifying the different stakeholders and then having some kind of incentives to, to make them adopt the standards and then working with those groups to make sure that they get them in a state that those stakeholders feel comfortable. I don't know the best way to put that, to put that on into the, to the slide, but those are the problems that I ran into, if that makes sense. Yeah. Alan, very much, very much so. Thank you. Ways to incentivize um, adopting standards. That, that's about what you were saying, uh, Nephi. They may have cut you off now. <laughs> you, you may be back into the silent. Uh, but anyway, hopefully that's what you were saying. Um, and, and we will um, find ways to make these uh, available so that y'all can, can suggest uh, revisions because um, we realize we're doing this on the fly. Um, so the, uh, the last I, also, I also think that Rob has Rob Rowley has his hand raised. Yeah, yeah I, I have a yeah I have a question about a wording. I know I don't want to wordsmith as much as that integrating and replacing that with exchange genomic data among healthcare systems. I kind of hear that from Nephi and Mark as less integrating just seems like an endpoint of information. Or exchanging. Well, so it was integrating into care. Yeah, I guess I'm saying exchange genomic. Yeah, because I mean, the, at the same time as that information might go to the healthcare system, but might also go out. And I think care into care seems like you're just trying to get it to the point of care. And when there's a lot more than going on to deliver it. But. Will, that, will that work? Or you just want to get rid of integrating complete? Because it seems as though that's still an issue, right? I think that wording is, is good. I think you have both integrating and exchanging. So I think, yeah. I think that's that's good. Better, but thank yeah. you, Rob, for that point. I'm also noticing in the chat that um, because these are all complicated issues, Jeff Ginsburg is saying it's that it seems like these areas need driver projects. Jeff, do you wanna say a little bit more about your definition of a driver project? Sure, um, and I'm taking the, the term from GA4GH, which is uh -huh. heavily involved in the in some of these standards, but I, I, I do think um, to galvanize the community to, to change the way that they're currently doing things or to do new things um, requires incentives. And yeah. it seems like NHGRI may be in a position to deliver that incentive with a, with a, you know, a, a project that could bring a number of systems together that currently aren't working together. Great. We really should move on past this one. Um, well, I see that um, Bruce Korf has his hand raised. Bruce, were you going to comment on on the second one on IT infrastructure? Uh, yeah, I was actually just going to ask the question, although I know our focus is on healthcare systems, should we be recognizing that even now, a fair amount of genomic data is obtained outside the context of formal healthcare systems? And I would bet in the future, even more will be. And it, does there need to be some way of integrating data obtained from various sources into the healthcare system? And it ultimately could empower patients much more than they currently are in terms of having control of, of their genomic data. Okay, oh, great. Well, good point. Um, so, so and I am uh, conscious of the time and wanting to get people out by five, but that may not. Okay. Happen. Uh, and I'll, I'll go back to being the timekeeper police. <laughs> Healthcare. Generally. Okay, so we have four more session, uh, uh, four more 
I know. panels to go through. I know. So let's go to health equity and access. All right. So, um, so just again, focusing on on some solutions um, and and areas that we could collaborate on. Um, uh, try to obtain clinical data more efficiently in uh, in or through HIEs. Uh, was one suggestion for a place we could look to collaborate. Another was to uh, find ways to share and, and develop effective engagement plans, probably something that lots of groups could use some help on. Do, do people agree or disagree uh, that, that those are, are uh, important potential areas for collaboration? No one has their hands up. You know, people are probably thinking and reading, and <laughs> which I do understand. This is Although I, I just want to comment that Sharon Terry and Sharon, if you'd want to weigh in yourself, because uh, you're, uh, please, you know, raise your hand and we'll unmute. But I think you're just making some very important points about using people as a central unit, not the data, and don't calling people data donors. Is Sharon, are you there? She said, "No need to speak." Oh, okay. All right. All right. Great. So, first, but I just paying attention volumes. to the. I, I I think it's very, this is Devin McGraw. I think it's very consistent with um, Mark's presentation right. um, okay. earlier in this session. Um, you know, it's it, people as uh, people in communities as genuine participants and not just um, uh, opinion givers or consultants or people that things are done to. <laughs> right, right. Okay, great. Okay. All right, Terry. So I think. All right. Um, any anyone else on the equity and access? Okay. Uh -huh. Great. Um, so these may need a little more um, work because you haven't seen them before. Um, so just in included a couple of key points. Uh, there was a lot of discussion or a lot of interest in the, the Mount Sinai uh, internal medicine curriculum. We've captured those questions and we'll share them with Nora and her colleagues and hopefully um, can get responses back that we will post on the meeting uh, web page, which I'll show you at the end. But again, if you just Google NHGRI genomic medicine meetings, uh, it should come right up. Um, in terms of solutions, uh, we heard uh, some, some interesting um, approaches to a consult service uh, at, at Vanderbilt, although it's, it's very time intensive. Uh, potential collaborations could be developing, implementing, and assessing the impact of both the uh, these training tracks that we've heard of and uh, consultation services. So, so that might be an area where some implementation research uh, could be tried. Um, we heard a lot about focusing the genetic counseling efforts on post-test rather than pre-test counseling, um, but we didn't hear a lot about addressing low resource settings in, in that um, situation, and that may be a place where some collaboration might be needed. Um, unloading automatable and basic functions from providers uh, seem to be a, a good solution, although difficult to implement. Establishing templates, there are some out there, and it would be nice uh, if those could be shared so that they could be uh, if possible, implemented in other systems, although the systems are really quite different. Um, the uh, idea of monthly case conferences or boards uh, was an interesting one. Is that something that we could do some collaboration on? Um, we, we have seen, I, I know the Geisinger My Code group does have a, um, a, a conference that they share. Um, Baylor for a long time was sharing theirs, as was Stanford. Um, and those, those seem to have dropped off, or at least maybe they dropped me off of their, their listservs. But at any rate, um, uh, is that something that we could consider uh, as a, you know, a place where uh, practice could be moved forward in a, in a more general way, recognizing there are issues when it comes to sharing uh, patient data, um, sharing quality advances. And I, I did love the point about let's not compete on quality, you know, crash as much as the other guys. Um, and then there, there was also mention of the Access to Genetic Counselor Services Act as a federal employee. I can't suggest advocacy, I'm just mentioning it here, um, and other potential solutions for uh, improved uh, genetic counselor access. Uh, comments from the group on these. There is, um, Cynthia James has her hand up. I would say, and while I didn't cover this in my talk, there was a lot of conversation in the chat from our allied health professional colleagues. So in addition, in the key points related to medical education, I think certainly education in nursing and PAs and so on may be worthwhile as a key point. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there's been a, a dearth since uh, niche peg uh, went away in terms of um, some of the curricular developments there that I think have languished. And I think also there's a potential role uh, for the Inner Society Coordinating Committee uh, to, uh, to look at this. I think that was also mentioned in uh, a chat comment. Yeah, I think there is some uh, some active work going on in that in uh, uh, for physicians assistants, if not for other. In fact, there, you know, long ago, um, NHGRI did did sort of spearhead um, through Rocky Rockover and and other uh, other folks um, uh, a, a series of tracks for for different kinds of providers. And uh, Nephi has his hand up again, so I'm going to unmute him. And I I'm going to direct this a little bit towards Mark, but. Um, at Intermountain through for Heredogene, we've formed variant review committees for the different uh, domains. And I know there was a lot of that that happened at Geisinger as well. And then I know there's also all this stuff that's done through ClinGen. I'm just wondering when you talked about ways to sort of distribute or collaborate on these types of things, that's an area I might just throw over to you, Mark, to think about, <laughs> you know, how can we, we've all got these, these things going on. How do we make them uh, work together a little better, I guess? Yeah, and I think that there is some, um, uh, you know, clearly ClinGen has some uh, uh, funding from uh, NHGRI, and um, there are a lot of the variant uh, expert panels in that, that um, uh, there's at least the potential to do some uh, public um, uh, facing uh, activities related to that. Um, and I had also put in the chat that um, I think this is something the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics would be potentially interested in exploring. Well, I might just, just jump in and, and point out the reason we started ClinGen, Nephi, was, was exactly what you're saying, is that there were, there were 20 at the time we knew of um, individual groups doing exactly this in, in, in you know, much the same way and coming to the same conclusions. And so uh, that's why we have ClinGen. And if there's a way to, to get more folks under that tent, recognizing that it may not be fast enough for an individual you know, clinical provider or institution, maybe those are, that's something that ClinGen can try and tackle, how to, how to address that. You know, that sounds good. I mean, the, yeah, the challenge for us is that we, we have kind of a timeline to get the, the results out to the patient. So we can't, um, but, but we're, we're putting a lot of effort into these interpretations. And so it would be nice to make sure that everybody gets the, the benefit um, somehow. Great. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting idea. So, so um, I'm just going to ask Renee, um, is there a way that we can save the chat? Because I think given the time, we're not going to be able to address everyone's uh, very excellent input, and I don't want to miss any of it. So if there's a way, Renee, that we can save the chat, that would it's be great. automatically saved. Okay, perfect. Unless you clear it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, so um, Terry, I just, um, it, we have 11 minutes and I know we have two more panels to go to. And then I did want you to make sure that we had that opportunity just to say sort of what the next steps are gonna be. Absolutely, That's, those are uh, on those slides as well. Um, so session five, um, so you can see the key points here in terms of collaborative solutions, uh, if we can um, uh, work together to demonstrate economic gains as well as improved outcomes from implementation. And we do have some programs going on in this area. Uh, NHGRI is a small institute and we can't fund it all, but if we can, can sort of leverage the work that's currently ongoing and try to bring these groups together, that's something we can do pretty well. Um, and, and so that's a thought. Um, Pat's, uh, sorry, um, Nancy's idea of adding a third cycle um, on, onto those two virtual cycles is a really intriguing one, and we ought to think about what that would look like for uh, payers, policymakers, regulators would be important in that third cycle as well. Um, there was a, a, a broad set of discussions around Daryl's um, uh, presentation of the novel maturity model, which, which really was eight defined outcomes. And several people uh, commented and presenters as well on, on the need to, to define and measure outcomes. Um, while that was a, a, a very useful and very interesting uh, uh, analysis that was done across 150 settings, it would be interesting to kind of look at what I referred to as the sort of clinical validity um, to others who might be using that information. So, so do these measures, you know, ring true with clinicians, with system leaders, with payers, et cetera? Uh, and then also the, the suggestion that these be applied longitudinally to, to assess progress. 
Um, but patient satisfaction measures like the net promoter score um, need to be included in clinical utility studies. Uh, payer advisory group needs to be engaged. We have tried in the past to engage with payers. It's been five or 10 years since we've done it. Actually, we did it 10 years ago and we did it five years ago, but it's probably time to do it again. So, um, so that would be an area that uh, collaboration would be helpful. Um, following patients and their outcomes across insurance plans and health systems, uh, which is difficult to do. Health information exchanges may help. And um, real world evidence um, is critical to demonstrate clinical uh, utility and the value of, of uh, treatment medicine. So generating that real world, world evidence. Comments on this? That's great, Karen. <laughs> great, thank you. Okay. Should we go on, Pat? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think as long as we, I think most of these comments are um, refinements, okay. um, and nuance, and as long as we can incorporate it afterwards, I, I think that it's best to move on. Okay, super. No, that's great. And yeah, putting them in the chat is probably the most effective way right. to get them, get them in there. Um, I'm going to skip over the key points and really because there were a number of, um, of solutions discussed in the last uh, session. Um, and I think we heard from, from Heidi how crucial it is to have dynamic, iterative interactions uh, between clinicians and labs for uh, interpretation and diagnosis. We heard this, Carol Bolt may remember it our, at our ninth. Uh, genomic medicine meeting about how important that interaction is. And so uh, finding better ways of doing that would be very important. Uh, unambiguous genotype representation and standardized data storage. We've heard this uh, before, as well as meaningful standardized phenotype data collection. And there are some standards that are, you know, sort of starting to poke their heads about. So they're not 20 anymore. They may be, you know, three or four. Uh, willingness and infrastructure to share individual level data globally. We, we don't have great infrastructure for doing that. Although, as you heard, there are four or five different sessions. I was uh, intrigued that Heidi didn't mention Klingar, which, which is uh, another way of doing that. But, and in the UK and Canada and Australia. Um, and um, multiple note, note, noting that, uh, that maintaining a high level of patient engagement um, in, in design, in partnership and carrying out the research, et cetera, and, and then analysis and interpretation leads to really substantive changes in the care processes and structural outcomes. And so, so that is, is something that really has to, has to be part and parcel of this work, and it's not something that we've done terribly well. Um, in terms of, of research opportunities, um, uh, one thing to, that could be done collaboratively collaboratively is to look at the impact of patient engagement on effectiveness or outcomes in genomic um, medicine uh, that has, has not been done in this field, though it's been done in other fields, uh, needing to define patient-informed outcomes for genomic medicine. I, I need to go back and look at Daryl's um, uh, eight measures. I'm not sure they were necessarily patient-informed outcomes. And as Mark said, um, right now, outcomes tend to be defined by the, the care, care providers and health systems. Uh, Jeff had suggested creating a national learning health system network. So, uh, you know, a network of all of you um, in some kind of a coordinating function, which is something that, uh, that the NIH can do, um, uh, you know, include um, stakeholders in, in that um, uh, process and have them have a meaningful role. Uh, and consider studies of the value of ending the diagnostic odyssey. We have considered these and are actually Nothing. Um, so the Undiagnosed Diseases Network is looking at this as well as, as Decipher um, in the UK is likely to address. So comments on this. So Cynthia James did put in a comment, um, but um, do you have something you'd like to say, Cynthia? No. Um, but Aaron, nothing particularly urgent. The chat is fine. Okay. Erin has her hand up. I'm happy to summarize it if you'd like me to, but. No, why don't, I, sorry, Cynthia, but if you, if you put it in the chat and, and you're, you're good, um, why don't we, sorry. Erin has yes, her and this is it. Can you hear me? My, my yes. comment isn't, um, it, it was more of a, a wordsmithing, but where we say define patient informed outcome might be define and, and catalog. Um, mm -hmm. I think we talked about this a little bit previously, but it would be uh, nice to have a collection of standard outcome measures that we can use as a community. 
Mm -hmm. Well, and the third piece of that is to, um, uh, um, you know, require utilization. So like the promise measures, um, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, funding announcements that say you have to use the pro uh, promise measures or develop new ones that meet the promise standards and that would be uh, deposited, so. Well, and, and Phoenix, uh, Aaron being, you know, being one of the key um, founders of Phoenix, uh, that might be a place as well to um, develop those. Anything else on this one at 4.57? No, we have three minutes left. Okay, and I want to thank the 87 of you who are still on, bless you. <laughs> um, I am impressed. So, all right, so our next steps from this meeting, we, um, we at NHGRI particularly, and many, many thanks uh, in advance and, and later to Janavi uh, Narula and Ellie Samer, who will uh, work with Pat, um, Renee, and me to produce a draft meeting summary and an executive summary uh, in the next few weeks. We'll share this on the, the GM14 website um, and provide a way for, for everyone to, to give us comments, but we're not going to be in a position to have sort of open editing or, you know, wordsmithing or that sort of thing. So we'll work out, you know, if you see something that is like just really egregious, um, we'll, we'll uh, try and make that change. Uh, I changed that. Uh, and then if warranted, we'll draft a white paper for publication. Um, and these typically include the moderators and the presenting presenters, uh, but you have to meet ICMJ, uh, ICMJE criteria. So at a minimum, you have to review and respond. You've all already contributed, but you have to review and respond to drafts. So questions about the next steps? If not, I can wind up and then Pat, you can close this out. Okay, I, I just wanted to thank um, uh, again, uh, all of the presenters and moderators and also to remind us what I mentioned in the beginning, um, the Duke University group has been fabulous. That's Teji Rafflebrooks and um, uh, Pamela Williams. I, I mentioned Jonavi and Ellie, uh, who, uh, yes, and Ellie who are our are, are, are rapporteurs. Um, and Gerald and, uh, and his group um, who are making all of the IT happen. But I really wanted to be sure to thank Renee Ryder, who was the driving force behind this entire meeting. You all got many, many emails from her. Um, she received many more from you. Uh, and, and many thanks to, to Renee uh, and, and my partner in crime, uh, Pat Kaburka. And Pat, I will turn this back over to you. Okay, well, thanks, Terry. So just, um, I'm sure everybody, um, I'm impressed, 80 some people are still on the line. I just want to add my thanks to all of the co contributions from the speakers, panelists, and uh, participants. Tremendous insights. And I'm leaving with a clear conclusion that we've made great progress since 2015, but we still have more challenges ahead. But with all of the input and the intellectual power of the people on this call, I really feel confident that we are going to come up with some solutions that will be truly actionable and meaningful. So thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.